We're talking about bullies. How do we keep our head in certain situations? Or when do we stand up and fight? And we're going to talk about all the different kind of bullies we meet as we are going down the road toward life change. If you, I mean, I would imagine most of us have reached some opposition at this point. And we're going to talk about the different things we encounter. You've stepped out of comfort zone, right? I hope. You've made a decision, whether it's you began this journey when we started 100% for 100 days, which is five weeks ago, actually. Or you're just starting this morning, and maybe I'm going to be able to convince you to start that journey. Regardless of our past, regardless of what we think about ourselves, we're going to decide, we're going to change, and we're going to go forward together. We're going to meet some opposition. And we're going to look at this, and one of the greatest ways to look at it is through the character of Moses. Moses is such a perfect example. At least I relate to him because I feel like the way that he meets opposition is exactly the way that I have met opposition in my life. Moses is assigned a task. God is going to come to him and say, I want you to return to Egypt from where you fled. You are a fugitive from there. And I want you to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Moses encounters his first bully himself. Right out of the gate in Exodus, Moses says, I can't. I am clumsy in speech, or I can't, I stutter, or I can't, I'm not good with words. The first bully I want to talk to you about this morning is you. John's kind of mentioned it, our inner dialogue. What is going on? What are the tapes that are playing in our head that have told us that, oh, yeah, you want to try and leave comfort zone? Oh, yeah, you want to try that change? Well, you can try, but you won't do it. Or how many times have you tried this and failed? Or how many times are you going to tell yourself you're going to get healthy or you're going to get control over your money or you're going to lay down that addiction? How many times are you going to tell yourself that? And the dialogue goes over and over and over and over. One of the women in one of my 100% groups uh, quoted Joyce Meyer, and I've used it so much in my own head. She said, Joyce said, I, you will put yourself on trial time and time and time again. You will consistently have yourself on trial. You'll, you mess up once. And like John talks about, we don't celebrate the victories. All we seem to dwell on is the fact that, oh, well, I said I wasn't going to eat like that anymore. I said I wasn't going to treat that person like that anymore. And then we make a mistake and we stumble and we trip. And immediately it's like, well, see, you shouldn't have tried that anyway. Well, see, you weren't ever really going to get that anyway. You're really not going to change. And we put ourselves on trial. We are our worst judge and jury. And we will do it over and over and over. We won't stop until we, we recognize it, then we go, I cannot bully myself. Because you will argue yourself out of life change. You will argue yourself out of an abundant life. John 10.10 10 is one of my favorite passages. It's Jesus saying, and he says, The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. Some translations say, have it abundantly. I, I, the 20-somethings have probably heard this a million times. It's one of my favorite passages because there's a couple of key things in here I want you to pick up on this morning. One is that Jesus is saying you can have a full life, not a half life, not a mundane life, not a tolerable life, not a eh, it's okay life, but a full, abundant, vibrant life is what is offered. But the most important part of that passage is a few words before, and it's may have. It's a choice. We have to choose every day if we're going to have an abundant life or we're going to stay stuck. We have to choose every day if we're going to get out of the ditch or we're going to decorate it. We have to make that choice. And the first bully you're going to encounter in making that choice is probably going to be you. Now, I used to have this philosophy. For about four years of my life, I spent time telling myself that I wasn't going to tell myself I was going to diet or exercise because I had told myself that time and time and time again to actually not do it. I would order, I can remember in my early 20s ordering the Tybo tape series. It was on VHS. Some of you don't know what those are. But there were, v, there were a box of VHS tapes came to my apartment in college and I was in there and I was Billy Blanks in it up for about two days and then I was like, see, you're not really going to stick to anything. And that happened with Turbo Jam and Tybo 2 and I mean every other set of DVDs that I bought and I just finally got to the point where I said I'm just not even going to do this anymore. I just decided I wasn't even going to tell myself that anymore and I've had friends that have said that to me. They said I'm not going to tell people I'm on a diet or I'm not going to tell people I'm going to lose weight or I'm not even going to tell myself that because I'm really not going to do it so I'm just not going to say that anymore. I've tried in the last couple of years to adopt a very different mentality. 
I'm going to tell myself that every day because one day might be the day that I do it. I'm going to tell myself every day that today I'm going to eat healthy. And I might trip up. Pastor Willie might make some awesome things out in the hallway. Might make it difficult. I told Willie, I was like, you're a food bully, Willie. I was like, you cook too well. And everything you make is wonderful. And he's been making stuff all week and he brings it into my office. And I'm like, Willie, you're killing me. But it's so good. Yes, let me have it. I, I just work out a little harder the next morning. Kind of. The idea is that if I tell myself, I'm just not even going to say that anymore because I'm probably never going to get there. Guess what? You're never going to get there. You have to decide that if I have to wake up every morning and say, today's the day I'm not going to whine or complain at work and I'm going to have a positive attitude, or today is the day I'm not going to be, uh, de you know, depressive and just consistently talking about how life has just handed me a raw deal, or today is the day I'm going to respect my spouse, or today is the day I'm not going to yell at my kids and my head's not going to spin and the flame thing. I mean, I, today is going to be that day. And when I decide to stop saying that, I understand the logic that I've had in the past. I understand that it seems easier. You're just being a realist, right? I don't ever want to be a realist at the expense of missing an abundant life. I don't ever want the reality of this world to keep me from the reality that God desires to hand to me. And I've got to stop putting myself on trial. I've got to stop the voices inside my head. I know that makes me sound crazy, but you know you've got them too. I've got... I've got to stop walking in that way, and I have to start to operate against those bullies, against myself. Now, there's other bullies we're going to meet along the way. And I want to explain to you something about bullies. Now, now we're talking about outside opposition, okay? Moses encountered a bully immediately right out of the gate, right after he says himself, you know, I can't talk, I stutter, I stumble in speech. He says, and Pharaoh won't listen to me. Moses was smart. Of course Pharaoh's not going to listen to him. Did he really? I'm, I have no doubt that Moses knew Pharaoh would say no because basically Moses is going to walk in and say, I realize I've murdered someone in your country. I realize I ran away and I'm back now. And would you mind giving over your entire workforce and building the pyramid yourself? I have no doubt that Moses knew Pharaoh's answer would be no. Moses knew that would be a bully. That would be an opposition. When we get opposition, whether it's known opposition, opposition that we expect, we knew that one person that we've been enabling over and over and over when we decided, I'm going to stop giving you money or because it's not healthy for you or me, or I'm going to start catering to your, stop catering to your addiction. We know that we're going to get some opposition when we start to make life change. And Moses knew that Pharaoh was going to oppose him, but there's a reason that Pharaoh opposed him, and also we're going to get opposition that will actually surprise us. And there's a reason for that as well. It's because we're all made up of systems. So when we do something with a group of people consistently and, and operate a certain capacity, like your family or perhaps your work environment or perhaps your friendship circle, when you operate like that long enough, it becomes what is called a system. You are in a system. And when you try and shift the system, the system will almost always try to shift back. Think of it as a spider web. Your life is made up of many, many, many relationships. And every little web of relationships, a work web, maybe a church web or a social group web, or your family web, whenever someone pulls on one of the strings, what happens? The entire web knows. When you leave your comfort zone, you make other people uncomfortable. When you step out in your family and you decide to make a change, your family won't know what to do with it. Now, a lot of that is on a conscious level, like Pharaoh, which someone we expect, but then the other level is very subconscious, that they don't understand that they're actually reacting to that system. And they don't understand that they may have even been asking you to change, encouraging you to change. And you may wonder, why is this so difficult? Why is my family not embracing what I'm trying to do? Or why do I hear comments like, oh, here you go again, getting all high and mighty, or oh, I'm sure, yeah, now you're Mr. Church person. Or, I mean, there's a list of things that get said to people. Oh, you're really never going to change? Are we doing that diet again? Oh, how many times have you said that you're going to get your finances in order? How many times have you said you're going to go to those meetings that you need to attend? We don't even realize that we've become so ingrained in a system that when we try and make a change, people naturally oppose us. If I take one step out of my comfort zone, the system either has to come with me or it needs to try and pull me back. And nine times out of ten, it's going to try and pull you back. 
You ever felt like that? Like you say, let's say it's a work environment, and you say, today I'm going to have a positive attitude at work. I'm not going to be irritated at that person over in that cubicle, and I'm not going to be irritated that, well, fill in the blank. And you go in, and you're doing great at about 9 o'clock. And by about 10 o'clock, someone says something, and it pushes just a little bit, and you think, I don't know if I'm going to make it. These people are idiots. I don't know how I'm going to walk through this. That's what we're thinking. Let's be honest. That's what we're thinking. And you take a step, and then all of a sudden you're like, wow, people got dumber today. This happened today. (laughs) Yesterday, I don't think they were like this, but today, because I decided to make a change. Honestly, guys, the system probably didn't change, but you're trying to shift and move, and you've made the system uncomfortable. You are more aware now. And then you're going to keep, if you can push through that, you know what's going to happen next is they're going to notice you're different. What's up with you lately? Why are you so nice? I've actually had people ask me that. Why are you nice? Like, what? I'm trying to be more positive. <laughs> really? Like, isn't this a good thing? What, what, what happens is we get so used to operating in a certain way with each other that we don't know how to even let other people get out of that way. And we don't, we do, can, and come in contact with opposition because they're so used to us being that way. They're so used to us behaving that way or helping them in that way that when we decide to make that change, they are just as uncomfortable as we are. And actually, it's almost just as difficult for them as it is for us. The system will always try and reset itself. I want you to remember as you take those steps to make that change, whatever the change that you've committed, it's going to require a lot of work in your mind. It's going to require a commitment. If you're anything like me, you started strong, and it's week five, and now those sacrifices, and hey... Okay. And those commitments <laughs> and those commitments are going to be more and more difficult to, t- to, to stick to, right? If you can counter that yet, you know, you started off, man, I'm going to get healthy. I'm going to get plugged into this. I'm going to make this. And then it's just things get in the way and busyness happens and comments get made and you rationalize yourself and bullies appear. You know, and they're not always, I gotta, I gotta keep clarifying this, I feel like, because sometimes we hear the word bully and we think of someone who's gonna pick you up by your feet and shake you over like a toilet or shove you in a locker and they're asking you for your lunch money. Some of you have those bullies in your life. They're that directly opposed to you changing. I think most of my bullies don't look like that. They look more like the person that is standing next to the person that is holding me by my feet and they're saying, yeah, you should just give him your lunch money. They're the ones that really with good intentions Ask ask some questions that make me go, really, can I do this? Really, can I stand up for myself? Really, can I make change? Can I actually be the person that I want to be? Because I feel like if they don't believe in me, if they don't encourage me, how am I going to know if I can do it? But they don't always mean to because the system is trying to reset itself. We don't always have to look at that negatively, though. When the system tries to reset itself and people start to ask you questions or make comments, you can actually start to look at that as fuel. Think about that change you tried to make and how someone makes it. I mean, I know when, when I started to get healthy and, and we've used Shane Davis and, and his example with his family before when he started to try and get healthy and he went to his family and said, could we have some vegetable options at family meals instead of pr- potatoes prepared six different ways? And you guys don't laugh because you know it's your family meal. Some of you are going to it this afternoon for Mother's Day. You're like, wow, I didn't know we could do potatoes this many ways and one vegetable. I mean, that's my, I mean, and, and I love it. My grandmother's the best cook in the world. Lots of potatoes. And when you go into that family system, you say, can we have some vegetables? All of a sudden, they're insulted and they're offended. And all you're trying to do is be healthy. I remember, I remember feeling so bad. I, my small group, I have a, one of my small groups that I've had for about three years, a, a group of wonderful women that I love so much. But about every Sunday, someone bakes something. And it's like Willie again. It's like, oh, I love that you're baking me things for me to eat. And if you bake it, I'll feel like I need to eat it. And I, and I was always, for two years, I think I've been scared to say, hey, can you not bake things and maybe pick up a veggie tray? Because that's really going to help me. And it was funny because I finally went in last Sunday because one, one of my other groups said they were going to hold me accountable to telling my small group, I don't, I can't, I have, this is a struggle. And I went in and I stumbled around it and they were like, yeah, that's fine. We don't have to bake something every Sunday. I was shocked by how, like, they actually wanted to encourage me in that regard because I had to start with my inner dialogue and then I was worried I was going to meet some of these bullies. 
But even in that same context, the same group that I have to ask to, to help me in this one regard, they also have to challenge me, and they also have to kind of push against me. So those are the kind of bullies I want to talk about now. Those bullies that you don't expect, but it's not necessarily negative. In fact, it might do us some good to start looking at criticism in a more positive light as fuel. Perhaps it will strengthen your resolve. Perhaps it will help you clarify your goals. Get, it, maybe someone will ask you questions that you didn't think to ask yourself when you decided to pursue that dream, pursue that life change. Maybe you haven't thought about it in a certain way. One of my favorite quotes that I found this week for you guys that I'm in love with now is from Aristotle, and it says, Criticism is something you can easily avoid by saying nothing, doing nothing, and being nothing. If you aren't walking out of your comfort zone enough, you won't get criticism. The system won't even notice a change because you're really not walking out. But if the system notices a change and you start to get some criticism, start to get some bully pushback, understand that that's part of it. And it, embrace it. Be excited about the fact that people are going to say, hey, what's going on? Why is this different? Maybe you can use that as fuel. Maybe it'll clarify what you're actually doing. There's a, uh, there's a parable that's been told for years, and, and I recently heard that John Maxwell has shared this. So I want to share this with you because it's a great way to look at the things that come up against you in life. There's a bird that decides that the whole flying to south thing is overrated. Like way too much effort. Remember when I shared with you last, it's like kind of running for me. Like way too much effort. You know, the whole flying south, I'm just not sure I'm into it. He says, you know, this time I'm just going to wait it out up here. I'm just going to stay up north. I'm not going to fly south, and we'll get through the winter. It'll be fine. So he watches as all his friends are leaving, and he decides he's just going to stay in the north. I'm going to stay. And it starts to get cold and colder, and all of a sudden he starts to get real uncomfortable, and he's like, oh, maybe this wasn't a good idea. Maybe I should have flown south. Oh, I should have done that, definitely. He starts to get colder, and he goes, he starts to get hungry because food is scarce, and he says, okay, I'm going to fly. I'm just going to have to try and make it because I can't stay here. So he takes off and he starts to fly south. And about halfway, he starts to, his wings start to freeze because it's so cold. And he starts to actually freeze up where he's not able to fly. So he lands and he goes, I guess this is it. This is the end. I'm frozen. There's no food. I don't know what I'm going to do. This is it. And along comes a cow. And the cow decides to, and I tried in the first service to find polite words to use this, um, and the audience actually helped me find some wonderful words. The cow decides to um, unload right on the bird. And the bird goes, great. Really? Really? This is exactly what I needed. I'm freezing. I'm starving. I can't make it south now. And you have unloaded on me. Really? We know how that feels, right? I'm trying to get ahead in my life. And you just keep giving stuff to me. You keep unloading on me. And then he starts to warm up a little bit, because apparently what cows unload is warm. And <laughs> as he starts to warm up, he can kind of move just a little bit, but he's kind of stuck. And a cat comes along, a sweet, precious cat comes along and pulls him out and cleans him up and eats him. John Maxwell says, the moral is, not everyone who craps on you is your enemy, and not everyone who cleans you up is your friend. As you start to make life change, you're going to find that people react in some very funny ways. And sometimes the people who've been asking you to change, when you actually start to change, they're so used to cleaning you up, they don't know how to handle it. And they want you back to normal. And other times the ones that seem to push and to challenge you more are the very ones you need to look at and let it strengthen your resolve. Criticism is easy to avoid if you do nothing, say nothing, and don't try and become anything. But if you want life change, you want abundant life, you have to move forward, and you have to choose to fight. Now, how do we fight our border bullies? We've got bullies that we might not expect that might surprise us, such as my kids weren't on board with the patience thing. They didn't seem to want to cooperate. And bullies that we could expect, and I probably should have expected that, but bullies that are like Pharaoh. and you know, Because with Moses... When Israel opposed him, I don't think he was planning on that one. Like, he knows he's clumsy in speech, and he knows Pharaoh's going to say no. But to actually have Israel, who's seen God do so many things, come in and they start to oppose him, that's an unexpected bully. That's not what he had planned. 
That's not what he'd expected. So we have unexpected bullies, we have expected bullies, and then we bully ourselves. Now, how do we fight them? Paul has one of my favorite passages in Philippians, and it says, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. The change that you have chosen to make in this 100% for 100 days might be the one thing you do. And every morning you might have to get up and say, the one thing I do, I have to push forward. I have to push forward through criticism, through opposition, through my bullies, through people that directly oppose me, and through the system that tries to push me back into the way that I've always operated. I have to fight my thoughts I have to allow questions to strengthen my resolve. I have to do one thing. I have to push forward. I love that Paul says that. A friend of mine has a saying. He says, it's either important or it isn't, and it can't be both at the same time. If we've decided to make a life change, it has to be important. It can't be both at the same time. And we're going to have to fight, and we're going to have to choose, and we're going to have to believe in ourselves first, and then we're going to have to resolve to push past opposition. Another thought I want to share with you this morning, though, because you know, it's funny, usually when I get the opportunity to share, I generally get to pick my own topic. So this topic was given to me, and I thought, okay, I don't know, I'll border bullies, okay. And so I started to do it, and then I started to kind of pull some stuff together, and I thought, man, I'm going to really share with you guys how to fight those bullies, how to push through any opposition, and I hope that you're going to do that, and you're getting some of that this morning. But I have to tell you what I realized more than anything else this morning as I, sh- as I prep for this and sharing this with you, is that I am a border bully. You know, I'm a part of a system too. And so just like when I change, the system reacts. When someone in my family changes, I react as well. If someone in my family tries to make a positive change, I'm not always the most encouraging because I'm not sure I believe it. If you find yourself saying statements like, well, that's just so-and-so, or so-and-so will never change, or that just won't be any different, or, well, you know that's how they always do things. You might be a border bully. Again, I'm not talking about the kind of bullies necessarily that hold you up by your feet and shake you. I'm, I'm talking about unknowingly. We don't realize that we have given up belief on some people. We have stopped. We've labeled it realism, We've said, well, that's just realistic. And, and to clarify, there are healthy boundaries with some of that. And I understand that when I say that's just so-and-so, that's me, or it is what it is, another statement I've been using a lot lately, it is what it is, that, there are, there's some health in that because it's me letting go of control, and I can't change someone else, and I understand that. And, but I wish, honestly, I wish that was why I used it most often because most often I, used it, I use it because I don't know that I always believe people will change, especially people that have hurt me or have hurt my family, and I've seen them do and cycle through things 10, 15, 20, 30 times, and I've just grown to start saying, well, that's just so-and-so. Well, that's just Uncle so-and-so. Well, that's just her. She won't be any different. She will always do that. They will always use their money like that. They will always fall into that addiction. And I've labeled it realism, but I have to tell you, in preparing for this to share with you this morning, God has convicted me of how often I do that, how I have given up on people, and I'm not in the business of giving up. You know, I don't have to be a doormat to have belief, and it doesn't make me naive to have hope. There's a passage where Jesus says something to his disciples as they ask him, who then will be saved? Who then will actually come into right standing with God? Who then will actually become whole and healed? And in Luke 18, 27, Jesus replies, what is impossible with man is possible with God. I love that when I think about border bullies coming against me, I want to look at them and I want to say, you know, if I do this with God, if I walk through this 100% for 100 days and I give it everything and God walks with me, I know that God can take me there. But how funny is it that I think possibly I've forgotten that God can take other people there as well. We all want a God that's out of the box, but we want to keep people in a box because it's safe. We become a border bully without even realizing it, because it's so easy to give up and to lose hope. This morning, what I received more than even trying to figure out how to push through my bullies was 
that I also need to not be a bully. I also need to take that person that I've kind of said, well, that's just so-and-so, and take them out of the so-and-so category and encourage them to pay attention to what I say and how I react to them. You know, part of the reason we often have a hard time and we become border bullies is because if that person got fixed, who would we have to complain about? If that person got fixed, who are we going to talk about at family dinners? If uncle so-and-so isn't such a so-and-so, such-and-such, who are we going to whine about? Or maybe we don't want people to change because if they get rid of their sin or their struggle, I might have to deal with mine. We keep people in a box. Just like we don't want to be kept in a box, we can't keep others in a box. Again, I'm not talking about healthy boundaries. I'm talking about a belief in what Jesus just said that we believe in a God that does the impossible. That with man, not all things are possible. Some things are impossible. With God, all things are possible. Everyone can come into right standing, even in round 12, 14, 20, whatever round they're on of trying to get rid of that one thing. The more that we tell them that, oh, how many times have you done this? Oh, now you're spiritual. Oh, now we're doing the church thing. If we say those things to people, just like they are damaging to the things that get said against us, and just like we're trying to move out of a system and we're trying to shake the web, they are doing the same thing. And we have to capitalize and celebrate every one of their victories just like we want to celebrate ours. It's easy to get into a that's just so-and-so. It's easy to get into that will never change. But not if we take hold of what Jesus is saying right here. What is impossible with man is possible with God. And it may be the one thing, like what Paul talks about, encouraging someone may be the one thing we do to push them on past their past and into what is forward. But we're called to do that. We're supposed to believe in each other. We all want to believe in something and we all want to be believed in. But we struggle when it comes to believing in each other because we've been hurt. And we're a part of a system that has operated like that for so long. That person in your office can change. Do you believe they can change? That person in your family, there might actually be a day that they do not bring that dysfunction into your home. Can you believe that? We have to believe that. We have to believe it for ourselves. And we have to believe it for each other. We don't have an option. We can never say that things will never be different. We can never say never. We have to choose to fight. If it's the one thing we do every day, forgetting what is behind and pressing forward, we have to choose to fight for an abundant life, for all that God offers us in our life. It's a may-have thing. You, it's a choice. We also have to offer that choice and that privilege and that freedom to everyone else that we come in contact with. We have to hold out the hope that everyone can change. We have to believe that they can. Let's pray. Father, you say that with man only some things are possible, but with you nothing is impossible. And that's the kind of God I choose to believe in, but if I believe in that kind of God, I have to also choose to believe that you can do that in anyone's life. And I'm going to face opposition, and other people are going to face opposition, but we have to choose to do the one thing, the one thing, forgetting what is behind and pressing on toward what is forward, to what we are called into being, Lord, I pray you would let the bullies in our lives give us clarity and wisdom and strengthen our resolve. Help them to ask questions that we may have not have thought to ask, but ultimately, Lord, that we would choose who to serve at the end of every battle, that we would choose to fight forever, that we would choose who to serve as we move forward. Amen.